Chapter 2 First Word On a rainy day in late November 1958, Natalie was wheeled into the delivery room at Booth Memorial Hospital in East L.A., groaning and tearing at the sheet on her gurney. The baby was crowning, and the doctor didn't have time to check her vital signs. It was busy, and the charity hospital, which operated on a shoestring budget, was short on nurses. Push, girl, he said. The young mother strained with all she had, and the baby came out into the doctor's hands. He hoisted it up by the ankles and swiftly clamped and cut the umbilical cord. Gasping under the bright lights, the newborn looked around at the humans towering over him and tried to focus on the new world. Then, thankfully, he began to cry and kick, and his identity assumed the blank mental state of a newborn human. It's a boy, the doctor pronounced, relieved to deliver a healthy baby given the young mother's poor history of prenatal care. A special feeling had overtaken Natalie during her final contractions. The nurse instinctively took the tiny being from the doctor to let the new mother hold it. Something had come over everyone. Even the doctor stopped and stared. You can't have him, Natalie cried. She'd had a change of heart. I want my baby. He's mine. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Natalie squeezed the baby hard against her breasts until his cries stopped and he almost suffocated. The doctor and nurse had to pry him away from her and suction his airway to get him breathing again. But he was fine and was soon wailing shrilly. Natalie had named him Bradley, after the charming boy who had knocked her up on a one-night stand in the back of a Ford station wagon on Malibu Beach. Natalie and baby Bradley's overnight observation had been successful. So the following morning, the discharge clerk picked up the phone and called for a cab. It was then that Morris Rosedale showed up. Where's my wife and my new son? His baritone voice mesmerized the clerk. Standing well over six feet in height, with chiseled features and shiny jet black hair that had been carefully combed back, he winked at the clerk suggestively, which caused her to blush. Despite having found out that the baby wasn't his, he had never agreed on his young wife's plan for adoption. Natalie was a prize beauty he had fought hard for, and a new baby brought good things into the world including keeping his mama home at night and away from the attentions of other men. You must be Mr. uh, Rosedale. Natalie has been expecting you since yesterday, stammered the confused clerk. Her hand shook as she fumbled the phone back in its receiver. The handsome young man with the flashing dark eyes often had that effect on women, and he knew how to use it. It was an asset that had just prevented a harsh scolding. Yes, darling. Now show me where my sweeties are and I'll get right out of your hair. Your wife and baby are in room 217. I have some papers for you to sign before you leave, sir. She decided the young father deserved another chance and smiled warmly. Morris had timed it perfectly. Waiting always made him anxious. He quickly signed the papers and birth certificate, escorting his wife and newborn baby out of the old hospital and into his blue and tan Chevy. Arriving at the alley behind the apartment they shared with his sister, he pulled up as close to the door as he could get. The rain was coming again, and a cold wind whipped them as they got out of the car. The proud father sheltered them under an umbrella and got them inside. He made sure they were comfortable and that there was food in the kitchen. Baby, I need to run to the store for cigarettes and beer, he said. He gave each of them a kiss. Okay, Mo, hurry back, Natalie said, wanting a couple of cold ones too. But he didn't come back for three days. It wasn't the first time she would lose him to his world of addictions and inner demons and it would not be the last. One evening the previous summer, Natalie McDuthie was hanging around with her new best friend, Annie Rosedale, who was in her early 20s. The two had met at a modeling audition in North Hollywood. When the audition didn't pan out, Natalie took a job at Shaggy's Pizza Parlor, where Annie had been waitressing for a couple of years. They had also gotten into the habit of going around to the nightclubs on Sunset Strip. Natalie was a leggy five foot seven inches with piercing sea green eyes, high cheekbones, and long strawberry blonde hair that she kept curled at the ends. The oldest of six, she had grown up hard and fast and could talk tough enough to pass for older than she was. She lived at home when she had to and stayed with friends when she could, or any place that took her away from her hard drinking, foul mouthed mother and Uncle Charles, who she called Chester the Molester. Annie was a shade taller with thick black hair down to her shoulders that glistened under bright lights. Together they were quite a sight, head-turners glammed up in high heels and dresses. 
Annie was always talking and Natalie was always in motion. Annie loved the high life and had tried to seduce Dean Martin, but she settled for a kiss at the bar. She was quick to pull a photo out to prove it. A week before Natalie's 18th birthday, the two girls were standing in line to get into a club on the strip. She was hiding her belly in a tight corset, even hoping she might miscarry and get rid of it. She hated to think she might have a baby, but abortions were dangerous and her mother would kill her if she ever found out. Morris Rosedale sauntered out of a liquor store and almost collided with him. Hey, you, said Annie to her brother. What you got there? Anything for us? She pointed at his brown paper bag. Well, hey, ya, sis, said Morris, tucking the bag under his arm to get her attention off it. His eyes were already on Natalie in her sleeveless cotton dress. And who is this young lady? The two locked eyes and didn't breathe for a moment. Morris expanded his chest and said, Honey, my name is Morris. What's yours? Um, Natalie. Nice to meet you. Annie stood back on her heels, surprised to see her friend wasn't tough talking now, and was even at a loss for words. Right then, a fire ignited between her brother and her best friend. Annie drew closer as if preparing to put it out. Well, sis, I gotta run, but I am sure gonna see you later, Natalie. Call me? said Natalie in a soft voice. I got her number, Mo. Why don't you get out of here and let us get into our club? Annie was talking tough. He grabbed the bag from under his arm, darted through the crowd, and took off down the street. Morris got Natalie's number and arranged to meet her after her shift was over at Shaky's Pizza. She found him virile and attractive, with a playful manner so entertaining it made her feel giddy. He had hooked her completely. After that, there was nothing that could break the spell between them. Not Natalie's pregnancy from the Malibu Beach House Party, where she had stayed over and met that cute young surfer. Not her mother's losing battle to control her firstborn daughter, who was growing into a woman. Not Morris's jail record that was soon to be disclosed, or his alcohol habit. Whether it was infatuation, love, or destiny, it was unbreakable. Within a few weeks, Mo was seeing more of Natalie than Annie was. Girls' night on the strip was down to once a week, when Mo went out with the boys to celebrate payday. It was on one Friday night, standing in a crowd waiting to get into a popular club, that Annie sounded the alarm. Nat, I had no intention of setting you two up. Mo is the black sheep of my family. He's been getting into trouble since he learned to tie his shoelaces. Annie puffed her cigarette and offered it to Natalie. Why are you telling me this shit now? Asked Natalie, sharing Annie's smoke. That's not fair. I think I can fall in love with him. He is... Hmm... She closed her eyes and tilted her chin up, as if she was savoring a morsel of delicious chocolate. Hey, honey, said Annie. You're getting way too ahead of yourself. I'm telling you, he's not going to be good for you. Natalie fussed under her breath, and Annie gave up. She could see it was futile, and that Natalie didn't mind going with a bad boy. Her petulant young friend saw it as a challenge. Finding out Mo was a black sheep just made him more desirable. Natalie was a knockout and she knew what to say to make Mo feel good about himself. He'd had to make her his own, to find a way to keep other men's hands off her, so he proposed. Natalie was quick to accept, knowing it would get her away from her mother and Uncle Charles, and relieve her of the constant demands in a house full of younger siblings. They had a rushed wedding at a small church on Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena shortly after Morris's 21st birthday. Hardly anyone could make it, only Annie and Natalie's older half-cousin, Shu. My beautiful girl. You're the best birthday present a man could ever have, said Mo after the rings were exchanged. They spent their wedding night in a cheap hotel down the street, got drunk, made love all night, and passed out until the hotel manager kicked them out at noon. Then they moved into Annie's cozy apartment, and Mo pretended to look for work while Natalie busied herself with reading magazines and setting up to cook in the tiny kitchen. She worked on her makeup and dreamed about having a nice family with her new husband who would build them a storybrook house with fruit trees and a white picket fence. A few weeks went by, then one night, Mo didn't come home. Morris is in jail, Nat, said Annie. He got caught breaking and entering, attempting to steal some televisions. Since it wasn't his first time, the judge threw the book at him. She bit her lip to avoid saying, I told you so. Oh, damn. I'm going to visit him. With Mo behind bars, it was the perfect opportunity for Natalie to tell him she was pregnant. I was thinking something was up with that little belly you're getting there, girl, said Morris. We'll have to make the best of it. She visited again a couple weeks later and cried with delight when she found he would be released shortly before the baby was due. Natalie tried to be a good mother to her newborn son. 
She never understood the change that had come over her, causing her to forego the adoption, but believed it was a sign that he was special. She would hold baby Bradley and breastfeed him whenever he cried like she had been told to. Spare the rod and spoil the child was no longer the proper way to care for a baby, someone said. The baby doctor also advised her to cut down on beer and cigarettes, but that made her cranky. One of Annie's friends, a nurse, said it wouldn't harm the baby, so she took that as a second opinion and kept up her habits. The downers Mars brought home after he got out also helped. Without the pills, Natalie would get stir-crazy sitting around and want to get out of the apartment. When Bradley was a few months old, Natalie went back to work. It seemed okay to feed him, change his diaper, and leave Bradley home alone for a shift. Sometimes Annie would go there and help when he cried. She visited Mo, who was back in jail again. She brought Bradley and was careful to remember her wedding ring. Look at him. Damn, I'm going to love him like my own son, said Mo. He's a beautiful baby. You're beautiful too, honey. Don't worry about this jail thing. I'm going to make everything right. I got my head on straight now. She wanted to believe him. At Shaky's Pizza Parlor in her little waitress's dress, Natalie moved with the natural grace of a dancer. She started avoiding her tough talk and was softly flirtatious, wearing her makeup like a movie star, emphasizing her eyes and lips. She enjoyed the attention of male customers, which eased her disturbing childhood memories of being left alone or abused. Their frequent compliments kept that part of herself that was oriented toward self-hatred in check. Bradley had been home alone since the morning. Natalie had fed and diapered him and left for her 10 a.m. shift. It wasn't unusual. She would get home at 5 or 6 o'clock and take care of him, and it didn't seem any harm was being done. But this time, she went straight out for drinks after work, figuring Annie would tend to Bradley when she came home. But Annie didn't come home. She'd pulled a double shift. Bradley was just old enough to cruise the furniture if you stood him by a couch or coffee table. But he couldn't get up by himself, so he was crawling around the floor, hungry and stinky in dirty diapers. The sun set. The room grew dark, but nobody came. He began to cry and didn't stop. If he cried hard enough, maybe someone would help him. He started to scream. The loud noise he made was the only thing he could control. Maybe someone would come. He kept screaming. A light came on in the room and he twisted his neck to see. It was like the ball in the sky that Mom had shown him. See the ball, Bradley? See the ball in the sky? She had held him up to the window and pointed to the full moon outside. Bawa, he had said. Bawa. No, Bradley, ball, she had insisted, becoming angry, but he couldn't get it right. He looked at the ball of light in the room that was brighter than the moon, and he stopped crying. He kept looking. The light helped him, and his tears began to dry. His hunger went away, too. Ba, he said, reaching for it. Ba, then it went away. The room darkened again, but he felt safe. He curled up on the floor and fell into a deep, peaceful sleep. Natalie came home hours later, drunk and noisy. Bradley! Where are you? She fumbled to turn on the lights and found him curled up on the floor. He opened his eyes and wasn't afraid of her. Oh my God, where is your aunt? Have you been alone all this time? Her sharp voice rang in his ears. Ball, he said, smiling up at her. It was his first word. Yes, ball, baby. Where's the ball? She looked out the window at the moonless night. Smart little shit, huh? She said to herself, and as she began to clean him up, Annie came in. Hey, I thought you were going to be here, Natalie said, complaining. I worked a double. Look, Nat, it's your job as a mother to get your ass home and take care of your baby, not date the damn customers, she said. Annie had reached the point where she wanted to throw her friend, her brother, and their baby out, all of them, 